and I can back up a little bit. Uh, fast muscle fibers react promptly and strongly. They fatigue rapidly. They are used when muscle tension must change frequently. Slow muscle fibers, of course, they have greater resistance to fatigue, and they are used mainly to maintain your posture. Muscles uh, react to stimulus coming in from uh, motor neurons. <laughs> Come on, pick it up. Muscles react uh, to stimulus coming in from motor neurons, of course. The axons will split into many, 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 many branches and activate many muscle fibers at the same time. And that way, of course, uh, you don't have all of these uh, singular reactions uh, taking place. Somebody took the other one. The axon will split into many branches. Okay. As the axon is activated, it releases a neurotransmitter, acetylcholine, acetylcholine memory and movement. Acetylcholine makes the muscles react to opening uh, by opening uh, sodium and calcium channels in the muscle fibers. The ionic change allows the muscle to contract. And that's what we're dealing with here. The point where the muscle fiber and the nerve stru uh, structure communicates is the neuromuscular junction. Uh, the neuromuscular junctions are large and they tend to be very effective, obviously, since we have such skilled dancers and athletes and whatnot. And there you go, neuromuscular junction. <laughs> Each neuromuscular junction uh, releases enough acetylcholine to not only cause one reaction, but several at the same time. This is what we were talking about before. How they branch out. Uh, one junction will control many, many muscles. One cause of muscle fatigue is due to diminished effectiveness of the uh, neuromuscular junction. That's what muscle fatigue is. But also a buildup of lactic acid. I walked up the uh, stairs today. Uh, usually, well, I had to go get the, uh, had to stop at the fifth floor. So, I um, stopped at the fifth floor. But I was, I don't know if I had made it to the sixth floor if I had just gone from the second floor to the sixth floor. That's, that's pretty, pretty far. Muscles develop coordination when axon terminals migrate to specific target muscles and acetylcholine receptors uh, migrate to the cluster axon tips allowing for more efficient muscle reaction. And of course we're looking for good muscle reaction. Muscles react because spinal or, or cranial nerves uh, send messages to the muscles through efferent neurons. Efferent neurons are the ones that send messages back from your central nervous system to your, to your extremities. Motor cells of the spinal cord are larger and faster than other motor neurons. Generally, small motor neurons activate slow muscles and are more easily excited. Large motor neurons tend to activate large muscles, which require more stimulation for activation. The body must maintain control over the position of the parts. This knowledge of the position and state of, the, uh, of its muscles and limbs is called proprioception, so that you know where you are. Um, and you know where, e where each muscle is. Uh, you're not standing there bouncing off the wall or, or collapsing into the wall. You know exactly where all your muscles are. Pro proprioception. This knowledge is maintained by select receptors that report muscle and joint positioning. Uh, one of them is the muscle spindle, it lies parallel to muscle fibers. 
and it tells you, it gives you vertical information. It usually gives you vertical information. Golgi tendon organs report on the position of the joints and are situated with one end attached to the tendon and one end attached to the muscle. Uh, yesterday I looked at weights uh, and I needed, uh, I needed to know uh, where all my uh, muscles were. Uh, I, needed, I needed that information. when I was lifted. Otherwise, I would have dropped a weight on my head. And I certainly didn't want to do that. I knew how much tension there was. Uh, I, knew, uh, I knew not only where the weight was, but whether I, my muscles were, were strong enough to, uh, to maintain that position with that, with that extra weight. I want to ask, uh, I, I noticed like some of the, um, I mean, my supplements and, you know, uh, with that weight lift, I know like when you, when you overstretch or overdo your weight, you know, there's sometimes you, I don't know if it's a snap or a bruise, and sometimes a bruise will, like, will show up. Uh, uh, like if you do like injury, uh, right. like injury, what is that right there? Is it like you torn muscle fiber? That's a torn muscle fiber. Mm -hmm. You gotta be real careful. Yeah. yeah. That is, uh, I noticed that some of them they overdo it, and, or they like, a, like how you were saying that position and information of where your muscles are. I, they probably don't really realize that we're, they overdo that part where they, um, the muscle. I know that some of them have like a bruise in the but yeah, that's not good. Uh, but they need to back off. They need that to heal before they try to, to max out again. And I'm guessing they have maxed out. That's, yeah. why, that's why they're tearing muscles, muscle fiber. Yeah, that's, that's real dangerous. Uh, because if you, if you tear a muscle away from the tendon, mm -hmm. it has to be reattached. So you have to be really, really careful. If it has to be reattached, that's surgery. And of course, if you do, if you don't, if you don't get it reattached, then it's not functioning. Uh, it may reattach in a, a matter of time, but it will never be the same strength. We see this with people that uh, take steroids a lot. We we see tendons torn away from muscles. Uh, normally, you don't see tendons going away from muscle unless somebody's on steroids. Yeah. Unless somebody's on steroids. Yeah. And this can be a really serious problem. I know lots of guys who are bodybuilders uh, who claim they weren't using steroids and then they tore a tendon away from a muscle and they're going, yeah. Okay. Uh, your muscles usually aren't, are, will only uh, sustain uh, a select amount of. Of uh, damage, a select amount of, of uh, weight uh, when you max out. You, know, you, can, you can only lift so much weight. You know, I only weigh 100, 185 pounds, so I can only lift a select amount of weight. Well, I haven't maxed out in probably 15 or 20 years, ever. I mean, it's stupid to max out and, and, and destroy yourself. It just doesn't make any sense. I had a friend that was a bodybuilder, and I, I had. I've shown you pictures, or I have pictures of it. Okay. Uh, he's a bodybuilder, and while he was uh, preparing for a national competition, he uh, he was in the gym, and um, he's gay, so he was flirting with these guys, and and they were teasing him about, you know, come on, little man, come on over here. You know, he's like 57 years old, and. Uh, they were teasing him, and he went over there, and he maxed out, and he ripped, he tore uh, a, a, a bicep muscle, tore it, tore it away from his, his arm. Well, the only way you could do that is to, if you're taking steroids, so that your muscle is that much stronger than, your, than the tendon is. And you only have so much, um, <laughs> your body can only sustain so much. So what your your friends are doing is they're, they're lifting away weight more than they and if they're not on steroids, then, then they're stupid. <laughs> because your body, your body can't do that. It just won't do that. I mean, I, I can only, I can only do what I can do. I had a fr uh, when I was up at Fort Belknap, I had a friend uh, from Puerto Rico, big guy, uh, really big guy, <laughs> uh, fairly large individual, and uh, we were, we were trying to move. A platform, and it was it was a bunch of uh, uh, 
It was, it was a bunch of wood just kind of thrown together, but the thing weighed a ton. I probably weighed five or 600 pounds, and there was just no way to get a hold of it. It was a problem. And so he lifted it, and I could not. I couldn't lift my, lift my end. Um, so I told him, you know, I can't do this. Otherwise, I, I, I would have injured myself. Maybe my back, maybe my shoulders. And, you know, you never know what's, what you could hurt. But he was a bigger guy, and he also had the light in. Something I, I didn't realize until afterwards. <laughs> I don't know why he was giving me the heavy end. I was a lot older than he was and a lot smaller than he was, but I got the heavy end. Anyway, your Golgi tendon organs uh, tell you the position of your joints. Um, and of course, this is, really gets kind of interesting, especially if you have to sustain uh, a relatively heavy weight for an extended length of time. Your, your joints will lose their, their uh, control over, the, over whatever it is that you're lifting. So it's one of the things that you have to think about, and that's one of the, reasons, that's one of the things that Golgi tendon organs, uh, they give you that kind of information. Muscle spindles are located in many areas of our skeletal muscular uh, fiber. Muscle spindles are actually spindle-shaped, <laughs> hence the name. Uh, it consists of an afferent element and an efferent element. The afferent it, uh, element is sending information to the, the central nervous system, and the efferent uh, function of the uh, muscle spindle is, gain, is getting information back from the central, central nervous system. Their primary function is to maintain uh, your posture, to tell you when you have been in a position too long. Uh, this can happen. This happened to me the other night. My dogs, for some reason, uh, my dogs usually sleep on the same side of the bed. They go to sleep. Everybody's fine. I, I roll around and do whatever I'm going to do. Uh, and the dogs either move out of my way or whatever. But for some reason, the two dogs, uh, one didn't want the other dog to get up on the bed. So I just kind of scoot over into the middle, one laid on one side of me, one laid on the other side, and they were very adamant about being in the position that they were in. And because of that, I had a hard time rolling over. So I woke up about two or three in the morning, <clears throat> um, and I was stiff. And the reason I was stiff is because I couldn't move. I mean, I had both these dogs pinning, down, pinning me down uh, by laying down on the, uh, on the, the covers. So they were actually pinning me down on the bed, and I couldn't, I couldn't roll over. It was very uncomfortable. Uh, so eventually I moved, and they moved. Usually they go to, one of them goes to the foot of the bed, and the other one sleeps over here, where my wife usually sleeps. The, I know, I know, I'm not supposed I thought, to have dogs in the house. No. I, I, was talking, uh, I wanted to mention, because you mentioned steroids, and then uh, like, uh, muscle injuries. Right. Uh, I noticed that some, some people, when they, when they injure their muscles or their backs, they usually get injected with steroids. Right. Not only do they steroids, but sometimes, like, like for me, I had the, I had the, the condition with my, with my arch. Sure. And the, one, of the, one of the suggestions they said was pumping steroids in. Okay. And I was, and I, I was kind of back, and I was like, nah, I, I don't really, I don't really do drugs or use sure. medicinal drugs or any kind of drugs. Right. And I was kind of want to stay away from that. Right. Um, how, how does that work with the steroids? Steroids accelerate the healing process. Okay. See, that's the reason people take steroids. Is, is, uh, they, when you lift weights, I lifted yesterday. So my muscles were all damaged right now, and I had to repair, my body has to repair those muscles. Um, so well, I don't really lift that much, so I don't do that much damage. But uh, so my body has to repair it, and actually that's how your body builds up muscle. Is by repairing and it, it will expand it. Uh, you, you notice that right after you've lifted weights, your your muscles are all uh, you're all buff, you know, you're all pumped up. And the reason you're what what pump being pumped up is is uh, water is uh, you have damaged your muscles, and water has gone into those muscles to protect you protect you your muscles. Uh, so the reason you look so big is because you got water. All, you've sucked all the water out of your system and you pumped it into your muscles to protect yourself because they're all damaged. Uh, so the next day, of course, well, I mean, it doesn't take that long. Uh, you know, six hours later, you're not nearly as pumped up as you were earlier. Uh, so so that's, that's what you're doing. You have to repair your muscles. 
So when you pump steroids into your system, it accelerates the healing process. Uh, so you can lift on one day, and uh, if you're on steroids, you can lift the next day. Same muscle muscle groups uh, without without doing any damage because they have repaired it at night. And this is the reason. Of course, you know you could take steroids, and if you didn't do anything with those muscles, you wouldn't get any bigger. I mean, steroids don't automatically make you make you muscular. Uh, what they do is they give you the opportunity to lift on a relatively continual basis, and then you repair uh, you repair your muscles. Uh, and when you do that, uh, they get larger, uh, and you can do this over an extended period of time, and then you're just big as a truck. Uh, because you know, you've repaired your muscles and you've replaced them with, uh, with, with new muscles. Yeah. Uh, the problem with steroid muscles is that uh, when you stop, uh, then you've got lots of stretched out skin yeah. and you've got lots of, you got lots of extra fat, I guess. <clears throat> Not fat. You have to replace it with something. Your body will replace it with something and usually it replaces it with fluid first and then, then fat. Yeah, then fat. Yeah, I have a brother-in-law that uh, he usually damages his body. One of the last thing he does is, is you know, steroid injection. Sure. And usually I see him laying like the whole day, the next day he's up again. He's up, yeah, it's, it's repaired itself. But steroids work, uh, you can't overuse them. I mean, if you've got damaged, if you got anything that's damaged, like a nerve, nerves that are damaged, it's just not going to repair the nerves, it just repairs your muscle mass. So, yeah, it works. Um, so when you've got athletes now, of course, uh, everybody's afraid of, of uh, performance enhancing drugs. So when you've got an athlete that injures themselves, it's, and it's a muscle injury, uh, the, uh, the uh, treatment should be steroids. But they can't use steroids anymore because they're, they're considered performance enhancing drugs. <clears throat> so this gets to be really kind of tricky because that guy really does need steroids mm -hmm. to repair his muscles. But then again, if he's, you know, he's a baseball player and, yeah. and he's shoot, shooting up with steroids, then he's going to get big as, as Barry Bonds was, who was huge, gigantic. Barry Bonds is riding bicycles now, so he's small. <laughs> he's not nearly as big as he used to. Uh, interesting guy. When a muscle fiber is activated, the muscle spindle reports rate of change. Rate of change refers to the change that the fiber has gone through to be able to function. The muscle uh, spindle also reports force. How much, how much uh, force did I have to use to be able to lift that weight? Uh, the force required to maintain a contraction. Uh, and this is one of the reasons why uh, I don't, there's a lot of different theories as to how to lift. <clears throat> My son's a slow lifter, so when he lifts, he really contracts that muscle for an extended length of time. Uh, I'm a, I'm a, I don't, I don't do it that way because it's well, I'm too old for one thing. Um, but you know, I, I lift as fast as I can. Uh, and he's got bigger muscles than I do, except for my triceps are bigger than his. Don't tell him I said, oh, it's, it's on, it's on the video. <laughs> Rats. Uh, and maybe my triceps aren't bigger than his now. Uh, he's uh, teaching school and he's going, he's getting his master's degree. So he doesn't have a whole lot of time to go to the gym. Uh, his poor fiance, every time, any free moment he has, he runs over to the gym to lift. So I would imagine, poor thing. She doesn't get to see him very often. Muscle spindles have two types of uh, receptor endings. Uh, primary uh, sensory endings uh, wrap, are wrapped around the middle of the fiber, and are activated during the initial phase of contraction, and then adapt to a lower discharge rate. The secondary sensory endings found near the smaller ends of the fiber are not activated at first, but only after prolonged use. Muscle spindles are informed of impending action through the two special motor neurons, the gamma motor neurons or gamma afferents in form of a change of position from the initial movement. Uh, they comprise about 30% of the efferent uh, fibers and alpha motor neurons. They perform initial movement. 70% of the efferent neurons are uh, alpha motor neurons.
neurons. So we have gamma and alpha uh, motor neurons. Well, individual muscle mo movement is monitored by the muscle spindle. Muscle contraction is monitored by the Golgi tendon organ. Golgi tendon organs are able to monitor muscle and, and joint movement because joint movement is controlled by tendons connected to, to muscles. And that's what it looks like. There's the Golgi tendon in there, giving us all that information that we need. Otherwise, we'd rip our muscles out. We'd, we'd rip our muscles away from our, our bones, our tendons away from our bones. And if you've ever had that kind of, that, that kind of damage, uh, I've never torn a muscle away from my bone, no matter how, um, how active I was. I ran track in college, uh, played softball and football in, uh, in the Air Force. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so no matter what, what I was doing and what horrible things I was doing to my body, I never tore a muscle away from, from tendon. I pulled muscles before. Uh, I sprained ankles before. Which is actually stretching this tendon. That's what a sprain is. It's, a, it's a stretching that tendon. And the, the, this tendon heals very slowly. I mean, once you, you stretch it farther than it's supposed to be, now you got, you, you've got a limp. Or, or you, you're, now you're hurt. And it's going to take months for that to, to heal. You know, when you're butchering the sheep or you're kind of, um, uh, anyway, you can see the, the tendon. Is that cool? Yeah, it is. You can just like, when you pull one side, you can see the whole muscle stretch into yeah. the whole back. Yeah. It's uh, like the white part, huh? Yeah. The white part and then it's like, yeah. Yeah, you can't, you can't eat those dogs can, of course, but we can't. I guess we could if we had sharp enough teeth, but we can't eat the tendons. Golgi tendon organs are somewhat insensitive to passive muscle stretch because they are connected to the elastic component of the tendon and it is only activated under heavy loads. Ah, so this is the way it works. <clears throat> so me standing here, I'm, my, I'm not really stre stretching any of my tendons, I'm not really stressing any of them, I'm not really lifting anything. If I tried to lift the table, then I would know why well, not that table is too late. How about this table? Oh, I better not. I'll kick that thing <laughs> off. Uh, if I lifted something that was really heavy, uh, then my tendons would tell me about it. They would tell me whether I could lift it uh, or not. Uh, people that uh, are bar bodybuilders, and I'm just a, um, a minor bodybuilder, uh, but people that are bodybuilders, sometimes we can carry things and it doesn't feel like anything. And the reason it doesn't feel like anything, I mean, I can lift 20 or 30 pounds without without even stressing myself. And the reason is because uh, um, normally uh, I'm lifting a lot more weight than that and I'm, I'm lifting it in a, in a different way. Uh, so when I carry 20 or 30 pounds, it's not really stressing my tendons. So it doesn't feel like anything to me. Other people when they lift or carry something, of course, uh, since they're not used to lifting that much weight, uh, it feels like a, a, a lot of weight, but I can lift 20 pounds and not even, and not even, it doesn't even feel like it weighs anything at all because I'm not stressing my tendons. And that's what, that's what is giving me that information. Uh, so it's kind of, kind of interesting. Uh, I can't do that because I don't have the right, okay, I've got a, <laughs> uh, I've got a video, but I can't show it to you because it doesn't work on this one. Uh, okay, so what the Golgi tendons do is they detect the overloads that threaten to tear muscles and ten tendons. Um, activating the Golgi tendon organs uh, inhibits the motor neurons supplying the muscles that pull on the tendon and thus by relaxing the tension prevents mechanical damage. So your, your, your uh, Golgi tendons will tell your muscles not to, not to lift that weight or to, to go ahead and let it drop. I mean, if you tried to pick up the, the end of a, tr of a car, your body would tell you not to do it. Your tendons would tell you not to do it because you might damage yourself. Uh, so we get these, these little pieces of information all the time. Well, whenever, if, <laughs> if you ever put yourself in that kind of a situation. There are 
there are two reflexes uh, that, are, that are maintained by the spinal cord uh, that are automatic and are not mediated by the brain. Uh, the flexion uh, re reflex is uh, activated when pain is applied to the leg. Uh, the muscles will contract, moving the, the affected part away from the stimulus. And of course, that's a, it's a, just a reflex action. And that's what the doctor was doing when he suspended your knee and then he hit that tendon right there. And it was a, just a reflex action. You really can't control it. Uh, if, you, if you do try to control it, you can see it. Uh, so the, the doctor was looking for uh, reflexes. And actually, there's one in, in every uh, joint. You've got, one in, you've got uh, reflexes in your elbow that they can test. Uh, you've got them in the back of your knee, then you've got them in the front of your knee. Uh, and that's uh, really what the doctor would try to do, is to check all of your reflexes. In the knee jerk uh, response, the quadricep muscles uh, that are contracted to, to allow the knee to bend is informed of tendon pressure that makes the muscle react by stretching. That's the stretching reflex. And these are the quadriceps here, of course. Uh, so when you hit this tendon, your, your foot kicks out. The primary lateral cortex, uh, the M1, controls all the muscle movement in the body. And as you can see, the M1 is up right at the top of your head. Uh, this area is probably the most protected uh, part of your skull. It's really hard to damage this part of your, of your brain because that part of your brain is protected by a really thick chunk of skull. Uh, it's also arched, and since it's arched, it's, it's even stronger. Uh, the other parts of your head, uh, the, the, the front of your skull, uh, the sides of your skull are relatively thin. Uh, so blows to those areas, of course, can affect you, uh, but it doesn't affect your movement. Normally, it doesn't affect your movement. And this is one of the reasons why football players, uh, why football players are still functional despite the fact that they've had a concussion. And you can send them back in, theoretically, of course. This is the old days. We don't do this anymore. Uh, but in the old days, you could send them back in. Because normally, uh, you don't damage the top part of your skull. Not only that, but your skull is, or your, your brain is suspended uh, on your uh, spinal column. So, you, so it's, it's like this. Well, if you get a blow on this side, you're going to get a rebound reaction on the other side. So it's really dangerous from one side to the other side. And you get the same thing front and back. Uh, so if you get hit in the front, of course, that's your prefrontal cortex. Uh, this is your reasoning portion of your brain, and this is your eyesight. And it's one of the reasons why they hold up fingers and they say, how many fingers am I holding up? They not only want you to count the number of fingers with your, with your eyes, with your, with your occipital lobe, but they also want to know if you can hear what they're saying. I mean, was it a blow to the side? Do, do we have, uh, can you not understand my language? Because Wernicke's area is right, right over here, right just above your ear. This is Wernicke's area, and that's the part of your brain that interprets language. Uh, so they're, they're asking you questions, and they want to know if you can hear it, uh, whether you can hear it, whether you understand language. So that's the kind of stuff that they're looking for. But if, you hit, if somebody hits on the top of their head, there's no rebound reaction. I mean, if you, if you hit... Any place on the side, you get a rebound reaction. So you not only hit, if you hit the, the right ear, then you also get a rebound reaction on the left ear. So wherever you get hit, and, uh, as long as it's on the side, then you get a rebound reaction. But if you get hit on top of the head, there is no rebound reaction. But you wouldn't be able to move, or you would, you would have a, a difficult time coordinating your movements. So of course, that would be fairly obvious if somebody couldn't move. Uh, so this is, if we get a concussion, uh, normally it's, it's somewhere around the brain, not on top of the brain. And like I said, this is the most protected area of your brain, this movement. Because the reality is, no matter what happens to you, if you're in an explosion, no matter what happens to you, you need to escape. So you need movement. You need to be able to escape. And that potentially is why humans have been able to survive up to this point as odd as that seems. <laughs> uh, 
the hands and the lips utilize the biggest portion of the, the area compared to the percentage of the body that they represent. Of course, we are manipulators. We do things with our hands. We also talk a lot, and speech is very important to us. Uh, communication is probably the reason that, that uh, humans have survived up to this point. So speech is important, uh, eating is important, but speech is probably more important. The fact that we are able to uh, manipulate our mouths and our lips uh, so that we can talk. Uh, and that talking is, of course, has, uh, has expanded our, uh, our civilized, uh, civilized man and has made us who we are today, our, our power of speech. Now, for the longest time, they, uh, they looked at uh, Neanderthal man, and they wor weren't really sure that this guy could make noise. Because, well, they uh, only found old skeletons, and all the, the old skeletons only had uh, the major bones. They had the femurs, they had the, the, the uh, uh, ulna and radius, and, and whatnot. Uh, they had the skull, they had the ribs, maybe, probably. Uh, but they didn't have any of the smaller bones. And of course, it is the smaller bones that give us the power of speech. Uh, especially a bone right here. Uh, as you can see, I have an Adam's apple because I'm male. Uh, and this, the, the hard part, there's two bones in there actually. There's one part that protects it, and then there's a tiny little bone called the hyoid bone. Hyoid bone. And that hyoid bone allows our voice box to function. Well, we had never found one in a Neanderthal man. And so some people speculated, well, since we've never found one, it must not, it must not have existed. And this person probably could speak. And that's why they died out. We're trying to figure out why they, why they died out. And then they found a skeleton in, uh, in the Middle East uh, that was a more intact skeleton. They found a hyoid bone. So they know that that wasn't true at all. I mean, when we find... Uh, skeletons of our, our, our distant ancestors uh, from millions of years ago. A lot of times those, are, those skeletons are a million years old. And not only that, I mean, this is, it's, bone is, pro, is calcium rich. Uh, so if it, you were uh, an insect of some kind uh, or a, a rodent, uh, that's, that's good food, that's good stuff. So the probability, and you can't chew the whole femur up, so you might as well chew up the, uh, these tiny little bones. And of course, for that reason, uh, we, didn't, uh, we didn't find any for an extended length of time. But the reality is their, their bodies were very similar to almost identical to ours. If we had somebody in here who was a Neanderthal or had Neanderthal ancestry, you couldn't tell the difference, except their skin would probably be a little bit paler. Uh, and they'd have brown eyes. Uh, I have blue eyes. Uh, of all of us, he, we all have Neanderthal DNA. As it turns out, we all have Neanderthal DNA. You guys have it because you came through, potentially you came through Asia, but we won't even talk about that. Um, uh, in, everybody has Neanderthal DNA except people that stay in Africa. The Africans in Africa right now do not have Neanderthal DNA. All the Neanderthals left and they migrated out. Maybe they were chased out, who knows, but they were, they, they migrated out um, and uh, then they spread through Europe and then they spread into Asia. And so all, all of us, you, you and me combined, put together, uh, we have Neanderthal DNA. I probably have a little bit more than you do because you're, you are farther away from, from uh, the Middle East than I am. I was, my people were uh, European, so we just went up a little, little ways. You guys went all the way through Europe and then down through into the Americas. That's probably how humanity spread. The M1 communica uh, communicates uh, with the rest of the body through the pyramidal system. Uh, the pyramidal system is a triangular shaped bundle of nerves that runs from the brain through the medulla and into the spinal cord. Lesions to this system will result in the inability to move select joints and limbs. And of course, the M1 region is very, very important to movement. And as you can see, this is the M1 region right here. This blue section here. 
is the M1 region. Not very large, but it's very well protected because it's on top of your head. Not only that, but if we uh, took uh, measurements of the thickness of our skulls, uh, there's, it's, it's thick right above our eyebrows, but it's also thick right on top of our heads. So this is actually the hardest part of our, of, of our skulls right here, what goes all the way back. Uh, but this is the softest part of our skull right here on our temporal lobes. Those uh, neurons that run from the M1 to the muscles that are not in the pyramidal system are said to be in the extrapyramidal system. These neurons control the spinal reflexes. Uh, I was going to, and I was going to show you that. I've got some pretty good videos dealing with this stuff. Um, next time, if I have the other projector, I don't know what, what happened to it. It wasn't there this morning. I hope I didn't leave it downstairs. It wasn't there this morning. Uh, the extrapyramidal system communicates with the spinal cord through two tracts the reticulospinal uh, tract and the rubrospinal tract. The extrapyramidal system not only handles spinal reflexes, but muscles responsible for breathing and muscles that control the head and the neck. Um, and that's really kind of, the head is actually pretty heavy, and it's on this tiny little stalk called our neck. Uh, it's, it's, uh, <laughs> so if you've ever fallen uh, a long distance and then hit the ground, uh, one of the things, the difficulties you had was controlling your head, holding your head down. Uh, what you really need to do is tuck your chin into your, into your chest so that when you hit, it won't be as much of a blow. But normally what happens is people lead with the back of their head. And then, of course, they, they have problems. The skull will, uh, uh, when it hits, the skull will depress in and it cuts the uh, spinal column right here because the skull's right here and it just slams into the spinal column and that's what happened to Christopher Reeve he fell over the head of a horse and he landed on his head uh, and his skull went, it, it sliced his spinal column this happens to motorcycle riders if they fall off the back of their motorcycles this is the reason why you need to, to wear a, uh, a helmet if you don't wear a helmet and you fall off the back of your, your motorcycle, you're pretty much dead. Pretty close, or a quadriplegic. We used to get these guys all the time. And they're still riding. No, they're not. They're dead. <laughs> Some of them I see on the roads, they have no helmets and they're going like bullet. Oh, sure. Yeah. I, well, it's, it's suicidal. Um, if they wreck the dead, they might as well just cash it in. They're also wearing shorts and flip-flops, you know, well, what, what do you expect? What's going to happen to you when you, if you fall off that bike? Mm -hmm. you, you, you know, you're just going to scrape skin out. You might as well cash it in right now. We used to get these people all the time. Uh, Iowa didn't have a helmet law, but Nebraska did. We were in Omaha. So uh, these guys would fall off their bikes in, in Iowa. When they're riding through Iowa, they, they wouldn't wear a helmet than if they had, they had an accident. People can't see motorcycles very well. They're really hard to see. The lights aren't very bright. Um, there's only one of them, so it doesn't always let, register with our brains that they're there. Uh, so there were all kinds of accidents. This is right at the beginning of the motorcycle craze. So these guys would uh, have an accident on their motorcycles. The first thing that hits is always their head. So they were brain dead. A lot of times they were, I mean, especially if they hit really hard on the back of their head, uh, they not only get a, uh, it not only takes their skull and makes them quadriplegic, but they've got a blow to the back of the head and then they get a rebound reaction in the prefrontal cortex. You got nothing going now. Now you got, you can't, they can't see because, you know, this is the portion of the brain that they, they've uh, destroyed. And they've also destroyed the front of their head the prefrontal cortex. So they would come in and, and they'd be brain dead and they would also be, uh, they, they would have to put them on life support. Uh, and we would do that and then we'd ask the, the, uh, the family whether they wanted to donate any organs. Because these guys are usually fairly young. Uh, they hadn't uh, been around enough to, to really destroy their organs. Uh, so we'd harvest everything if they, if, I mean if they, 
papers. We didn't steal anything. That's not right. <laughs> no, we're not thieves. We weren't thieves. We, we, we just harvested the organs. And that was our job, was harvesting the organs at my hospital. So we get these people and then we put them in uh, ICU. And of course, they're on life support. We're breathing for them. Uh, we've got a heart monitor that's, that's forcing their heart to beat. And as long as we could keep their blood circulating, they were okay. They were still alive, kind of, in a vegetative state. And then we would uh, arrange to harvest the organs. And we had two trans uh, uh, hospitals of transplant in town. So we, would, we would, were the suppliers. Sounds gross, doesn't it? Sorry. Somebody's got to do it, right? I mean, otherwise, no transplants, right? If you don't, if you're that squeamish about this kind of stuff. Anyway, saved a lot of lives. So one guy dies and we save nine lives. As tragic as the death was. Okay. Well, let's talk about sex. It's, it's Monday morning. Why not? Let's talk about sex. Chapter 12. Is that the next chapter? Okay. Is it? Sex. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> Yay, balloons. Okay, let's go ahead and talk about sex. Um, there are four stages of the reproductive behavior. Uh, stage one is sexual attraction. In most species, sexual attraction cannot take place until the female is ready to reproduce. But we are humans. We can re reproduce at any time. Uh, or at least we can have uh, intercourse at any time. Other animals, they can't have sex unless the female is... Um, receptive and she's only receptive when she's in heat uh, so that's the reason you don't see um, bulls mounting uh, heifers in the, in the, in the uh, you know just mounting heifers all, all day long uh, or dogs just jumping on each other sometimes they will do that but it's just practice I guess they're not really uh, inserting it their the penis in front of the female's vagina. Um, <clears throat> they have to be receptive. This can be judged by whether males approach her and how rapidly they approach her. If she is in heat, if it's a uh, if it's a rat, and she's in heat, then all the male the males will uh, try to get around her. Now the rats are really kind of interesting because they don't really fight over the female. Uh, what will happen is uh, they usually go by hierarchy. Uh, so the male, the alpha male, will get first. Uh, will, be, will be the first to uh, reap, will uh, to mount the uh, female. Uh, then the number two, the beta, uh, the beta rat will uh, be the second one, and then on down the line. Um, some animals fight over this stuff. Some animals don't. Uh, dogs, uh, they will fight for the right to to uh, uh, to mount the uh, the female. And uh, a lot of times when the beta and the alpha male are fighting, then other males will, will mount her. So she will be breed, bred not by the alpha or the beta male, but by one of the, one of the secondary males. Happens all the time. Usually it's a small dog. Uh, it's the only way small dogs are able to reproduce, because otherwise the pit bull would get to reproduce every time. It just doesn't happen that way. The female will show attraction to the male uh, by whether she allows him to approach. Usually when a female is in heat, she's pretty snippy. Uh, and it's only when she is ready and she is uh, uh, able to uh, reproduce that she will allow him to approach her. Uh, a good example are wolverines. Wolverines are very singular uh, individuals. They have their own territory. Uh, males and females are not in the same territory ever. Um, but when she is in heat, then he is allowed to come into her territory, and he will he will find her and uh, 
and mate with her, and that's the only way wolverines are able to uh, survive. Otherwise, she'd kill him. If he comes into her territory, and that's one of the reasons why you, you uh, unless you have a uh, female wolverine with pups, uh, the only time you see more than one wolverine with another wolverine is when the, during breeding season. It's the only time that she will allow other wolverines to be in, in her territory. You guys don't have wolverines down here, but we had them up in uh, Montana. And I saw a number of them uh, while I was, was in Montana. Which is something you almost never see because they're very reclusive animals. And, and you only, there's only uh, a single uh, wolverine in the territory unless she has babies. Uh, they're huge. Well, they're about this big. And they're pure, I don't, have you, uh, you've never seen a badger fight. Uh, they're members of the badger family. And badgers, you can't kill them. You have to shoot, you have to cut their heads off to kill them. I mean, they're amazing. And their heads are, you know, really well. I had, uh, did you ever see my big dog? 200 pounds? 200 yeah. pound dogs? Okay. It's huge. I and mean, actually came up to the porch for one the first Christmas we were there, because uh -huh. um, usually the, the, uh, the heat from the car, the heat from the door escapes through our uh -huh. underneath the door. So when you open the door, you see all these dogs huddled underneath our, our door. Uh -huh. <laughs> There's a mat there too, so it warms. Every morning you wake, you, when you get up, you put it the door, and you see them all getting up. And, and leaving, so they should involved. Yeah, he weighs 200 pounds, and he and a 100 pound dog got a hold of a badger. And I'm thinking, oh, that poor badger, they're going to rip him apart. No, they lost. 300 pounds of dog and maybe uh, 30 pounds of, of badger, and the badger alone. Mm -hmm. And they came, they came off, uh, out of that encounter with cuts on their faces. They grabbed a hold of that badger, and they were pulling it. A 200-pound dog, and I wondered, I know, it sounds horrible. <laughs> and I was going to go and try to save the badger. I didn't need to. The, both the dogs retreated, and they fought with that badger for about 15 minutes and didn't injure the badger even a little bit. I know, that's how tough it is. Why am I talking about this? Oh, wolverines are bigger. They're like twice as big as a, as a badger. Uh, they're relatively, well, they're short and squat, and they, they walk like this. It's really kind of funny to watch them walk. And I, I saw a bunch of them up in my thing. They have, uh, I think they have one over here, the lake, the badger. Oh, is that right? I don't know if it's there anymore. They drained it a couple years ago. I don't remember if uh, you build its uh, territory. Uh -huh. Don't mess with it. It's, it's tail is here, here, here across the lake. And the sides of it's making it. Oh, you're talking about a, you're talking about a beef. Yeah, that one. Yeah. Even that one. Yeah. Getting close to it, and it's just. Let's go up to you and you know, uh, tail towards you. It's, you know, it's not afraid of anything. <clears throat> in many mammalian spa species, a female will demonstrate her approachability through swelling in the vaginal area that is a different color and an odor regulated by a surge of estrogen, uh, which she'll put off. And of course, these are pheromones. She's trying to tell uh, all the males in the area that she's ready to reproduce. Uh, they, the males will come from all over. Uh, the larger the dog, uh, the more likely that that dog will get to uh, uh, reproduce with the female. Uh, the male dogs will fight uh, until she's ready to, uh, to breed. And then uh, it's just like other animals. The alpha male will go first, the beta male will go second. Uh, a lot of times uh, the males will try to approach the female uh, before she's ready, and she will she will chase them away, uh, usually by biting them and tearing uh, portions of their body. And this is one of the reasons why you see a lot of dogs with torn ears. If the dog is uh, is a viable male, uh, then uh, he tried to approach a female before she was ready. This is another reason why male dogs will very rarely attack female dogs. It's for it's because they will uh, they want to breed with them. Uh, so they won't fight, the males will fight males, uh, females will fight females, but males will not fight males, or females, I'm sorry. 
because that's just the way it is. And most species intercourse is not possible without full female cooperation. Uh, for one thing, she has to put her body in the right position. Uh, she has to lift up her, her uh, hind quarters and she has to uh, hyperextend her, her back, her spinal column, uh, to open up her vaginal opening. Normally when she is just standing there, uh, then uh, the opening is at an angle and the male can't penetrate, uh, but when she puts herself in a, a position called lordosis, uh, then she uh, elevates her, her rump and she, hyper, she uh, uh, hyperextends her, her spinal column so that it gives a, the, uh, an, the uh, male a, a straight shot into her re reproductive area, into her vagina. Otherwise, it's impossible. Otherwise, they don't go together. Uh, stage two is the appetitive stage, behavior that establishes, maintains, or promotes sexual behavior. When a female is displaying this behavior, she may approach a male. Uh, she may stay close to the male, uh, wanting the, the male to be uh, the individual that she reproduces with. She may show alternating approach and retreat behavior. Uh, she may move in a specific manner that will result in the male ma mounting the female. Uh, it was kind of interesting. Uh, I was at the uh, Frankfurt Zoo uh, in Frankfurt, Germany, and uh, they had uh, some kind of monkeys. Pretty big monkeys. Uh, macaques. They were macaques. And uh, it was breeding season. <laughs> it was breeding season. This is back in 1980, 81, 82. Anyway, so the, uh, the, the macaque breeding started. And of course, I, was, I just happened to be there when it happened. And here the male would, uh, the females were walking around with their rumps stuck up in the air. And of course, they, there was an odor about them. But they were also uh, putting them, their, uh, themselves in a uh, select position. And the male would grab hold of the female he uh, had an erect penis, and what he'd do, he'd pump her a couple times and throw her off. And then, then and there were like five females just walking around, just kind of walking around with their butts stuck up in the air. And he'd grab one of them and pump them a couple times and throw them off. It was really kind of interesting. He was reproducing with them. I don't know how often he was ejaculating. He wasn't spending a whole lot of time with any one female, but uh, he would grab them. And, and, and this went on for hours went on for hours. Um, <laughs> uh, I got there when it first started and uh, I left and then I came back and they were, it was still going on. By that time, uh, the Germans were just agog. I mean, and they had called all their friends. And so there were, the place was just packed. But I was there when it first started. I came back a couple hours later, it was still going on. Uh, the funny thing is, and this isn't that funny, I guess, um, I, was, I was in Frankfurt with my softball team, and so most of these guys wanted to go see a sex show. So, <laughs> so they went one way, and I went to the zoo. <laughs> of course, I was at the zoo by myself. All the other guys, you know, the cool guys, they went to these sex shows. And here, you know, I talked about to, to them afterwards, and they were telling me what was going on. And it was just really kind of boring, you know. And I told them, I told them about what I said. They said, yeah, you probably saw better stuff than we did. Anyway, I know. You know guys. You know how guys are. There's something wrong with all of them. Every damn single one of them. Anyway, where were we headed? Berlin. We were headed to Berlin. And of course, this is when the wall was up. So we had, to, we're, we were riding on a troop train. And we picked up the troop train in Frankfurt. And then... We'd cross the border, and every time we crossed the border, the Germans would stop us, or the Russians would stop us. Like the Germans weren't allowed to do anything with us, the East Germans. So we had Russians walking through the, the cars and whatnot. The Russians weren't allowed to have pornography, so and of course the porno pornography in 1982 was not that it was not like the pornography is today. Anyway, and, and of course there was no internet in 1982, so, you know, we were, the guys had hustlers and Playboy magazines. Of course the German, or the Russians had never seen anything like that. So somebody would offer them 
a magazine and they were, oh, no, no, no. <laughs> then you'd trade them, you'd trade them uh, the magazines or something. Something Russian. Whatever the Russian thing was, it always broke down real fast. Anyway, not important. Okay, appetite and behavior. A behavior that establishes, maintains, or promotes sexual behavior. A lot of things can take, happen, uh, can take place. This is known as perceptive behavior, uh, this uh, second stage, uh, where she is almost ready to reproduce. The male appetite behavior may consist of staying near and sniffing the female, uh, so the male will sniff the female a lot, um, usually in their reproductive area. Um, stage three, of course, is copulation or, or coitus, coitus. Coitus. Copulation begins when the male puts his penis in the female vagina, an act known as intromission. The rhythmic, uh, through rhythmic movements, the male will then squirt sperm-filled semen into the female's reproductive tract. After copulation, uh, the two will go through a period when they will not be able to re-engage in intercourse. This is known as a refractory uh, phase. However, a male presented with another female may show a shorter refractory phase, and this is known as the Coolidge effect. Once upon a time in a, in a, a chicken farm in Iowa, uh, the president, Calvin Coolidge, and his wife were, were inspecting the farm, and they were being shown around the farm, and what uh, Coolidge saw, or what it was really kind of interesting, the uh, um, I, I don't know if you understand how chickens work, but uh, um, the uh, Coolidge was looking at, at one thing, and his wife was off uh, in an, at, at another area, and she was watching this rooster uh, breeding all these females. And and here he was like breeding a female every every couple of minutes. He was, he was mounting a female uh, a hen, and, and he was breeding with them, and that of course allowed them to lay eggs. And that was the whole purpose. It was not only it was not only the chicken farm, it was also an egg farm. Uh, so she said, Calvin, Calvin, come over here. And, and Coolidge came. They were with all these newspaper men. And she said, look, look at this guy. Can, look at, at, at all the females that this guy can breed with. And, of course, Coolidge, who was a joker, uh, said, yeah, if, you've, if you present me with that many fe receptive females, I could have sex that often as well. And of course, she she was shocked, and the, all the reporters thought it was the funniest thing in the world. And that's why they call it the Coolidge effect. If you pers if uh, a male has access to more than one uh, breeding female, then he can have his refractory phase is reduced. So a male with, uh, with several females is able to actually breed with all of them. When a female is ready to copulate, she will be sexually receptive, and of course, coitus has taken place now, uh, and. Uh, now the reproduction potentially has, has, has taken place. The, post, the stage four is known as a post-copulatory uh, behavior. This is different in most species. The males of all, all mammals, but primates achieve and maintain their erections with a bone in their penis called an os penis. In other words, that's what, uh, that's what an erection is as far as a dog is concerned, as far as a a horse is concerned, as far as a cow is concerned, as far as a whale is concerned, they have a bone that, uh, that actually is injected down into the penis that allows them to have an erection. Humans, of course, uh, and some of the higher primates, uh, we utilize blood flow uh, to, to maintain erections. Uh, sometimes, as far as the dog is concerned, sometimes, as far as the animal is concerned, they get stuck. The female is no longer receptive. Uh, the male is has his bone uh, stuck in a uh, in, in a female dog, and they have a difficult time. He has a difficult time pulling it back. He has to get in the right position for the bone to uh, actually come out. Uh, and of course, they get stuck, and then they start crying. She starts crying because she's in the wrong position. Uh, he starts crying because, of course, it's very it's relatively painful. Uh, and normally you can uh, you can get them, them apart by uh, splashing water on them, a lot of water. That usually that usually shrinks everything up and allows the 
the, uh, the male to uh, pull his, his uh, the os penis back into his, his abdomen. Normally with a dog, uh, the os, the, the bone portion of the penis is in their abdomen and it's only during, when uh, they are uh, potentially copulatory do they inject the bone into their penis. The whole purpose of copulation is the joining of the male and the female gametes, the ova in the, fe uh, in the female and the sperm in the male. If the two join, the ova will become fertilizer, fertilized and the union will become a zygote. Okay, so we have created, we have created a, uh, a new animal now and it's known as a zygote. While all mammals, birds and most reptiles fertilize inside the body, Internal fertilization, fish and frog, this is known as internal uh, fertilization. Fish and frogs fertilize outside the body, and that, of course, is external fertilization. So almost all animals use internal fertilization, or the fertilization takes place in the female's body, but fish and frogs fertilize outside the body. External fertilization. If the species lays eggs outside the body, as birds and reptiles do, it is called oviparity or egg birth. If the species allows a zygote to develop in the female's body, it is uh, referred to as viviparity or live birth. And that's the way humans do it, of course. It's the way all, all mammals do it. They have over, uh, viviparity. For most creatures, there is only one sexual position they can be in for copulation to be possible. Uh, since most mammals walk on all fours and have a tail, reproduction can only take place if the female raises her rump and moves her tail to the side. This will usually straighten her vagina adequately for uh, penetration. This is known as lordosis. If you've ever had a cat in heat, that's what they will do. Uh, they will put themselves in this position. She has to raise her rump up. She has to straighten her back out. She needs to move her tail to, the one, to, to uh, one side so that the uh, male can penetrate uh, and it, it straightens out her vagina, making it more likely that she will, well, making it possible for her to reproduce. And that's what lordosis looks like. <clears throat> for frogs to mate successfully, the male must mount the female. There is no penetration, but as the female emits her unfertilized eggs, the male must release his semen. So it has to be in tandem. She releases the ova, he releases his, his sperm. If this does not take place in or over water, reproduction will not take place. This uh, uh, position is known as amplexus, where the male is on top of the female. If you grab a hold of her, uh, he will put his, uh, uh, his reproductive area very close to hers. And as she releases her ova, he will release his, his semen. And of course, if this doesn't take place, if they do it over uh, dry land, then the reproduction will not take place. Uh, but if they do it over water, of course, or, or close to water, uh, then uh, uh, reproduction will take place. And this is known as amplexus, with the male on top of the female. While sexual response is extremely complex, uh, the female anatomy for intercourse is relatively simple. As strange as that may seem, the female is far more, uh, is, has a um, far more simple uh, reproductive area than males do. There are two folds of skin that cover the, uh, and protect the vaginal opening. These are the labia, the labia majora and the labia minora. Uh, the only reason that we really talk about the labia is because uh, in some cultures they actually cut away the labia. And that's it's known as female circumcision. Uh, the female erectile tissue is the clitoris above the vaginal opening. Uh, the clitoris, the clitoris is very similar to the male penis. <clears throat> and sometimes, unfortunately, some cultures will cut away the clitoris as well. Uh, there, in some cultures, uh, the female is considered to be over, overly sexual. They don't want her to, to respond sexually at all. Uh, they just want her to reproduce. They don't want her to have a good time. Uh, so one of the things that they do is they cut off the clitoris. They also may cut, cut away the la both labians. And it's part of their culture. And it really all depends on who we're dealing with as to how, how much uh, damage, not damage, 
damage, that's not the right word, how much is actually cut away. I know, as horrible as all those things sound, it's part of their culture, and there's not a whole lot that we could say about it other than it's part of their culture. Uh, I was uh, teaching uh, in uh, Oklahoma City, and one of the uh, individuals uh, in my class was Nigerian. He was a Nigerian Christian. Um, it's very common for Nigerian Muslims uh, to circumcise their females, uh, circumcise the women. Uh, but uh, he was a Christian, and we had that conversation. I, I knew this. I, I knew that there was a, a question about this. And so I asked him about it, and he said uh, uh, that he didn't like American women. Uh, he, he said, uh, they're, they're oversexed. There's something wrong with them. Uh, he said, 98% of all the women in Nigeria are circumcised. And for that reason, of course, they're, they are marriageable, but women in the United States aren't marriageable because they don't have any control over their sexuality. According to his culture, it was the women that are, are the uh, sexual uh, aggressors. And if you don't do this, then uh, they become even more sexually aggressive. So in his culture, they believed in, I, and I don't know if this was back in... Uh, when was, was I in the early 90s? So it, it may, things may have changed, I don't know. But he was saying that he would never marry a, an American woman because they were just oversexed and had no control over their sexuality. Since male delivery of the gamete requires penetration, the male system is more complex than that of the female. Erection takes place, place due to an engorgement of blood uh, semen is produced in the testes and stored in the epididymis. During ejaculation, the sperm travels up the vas deferens through the seminal vesicles, uh, the prostate gland, and the Calvers gland, where it picks up a viscous alkaline fluid called semen. So this is where it gets all of the. It's uh, this is where it gets the semen. Uh, the reality is that all of these uh, all of these glands. Uh, produce a more and more alkaline uh, uh, substance. And if, if one of these glands isn't working properly and the uh, semen isn't properly alkaline, then it cannot neutralize the uh, acidity of the female reproductive uh, system. The female reproductive system protects itself from bacteria uh, because it is so acidic. So what the male has to do is it has to neutralize the acidity of the female reproductive system. Otherwise, reproduction will not take place. It can't take place. Uh, of course, I used to do this when I was in the laboratory. We used to try to determine why somebody wasn't reproducing. And one of the things we discovered was if, if one of these organs was plugged, if one of these glands was plugged, uh, then a lot of, of times what we, you would have would be a, uh, uh, a neutral semen, or the semen wasn't alkaline enough to neutralize the, uh, the uh, female acidity. It's very important that the female protect herself from bacteria. So she needs a very uh, acidic uh, reproductive area. That protects her from bacteria. The male, of course, has to neutralize that in order to reproduce. And that's why he has all of these glands. You can imagine, well, maybe you can't. Uh, so the vas deferens is the, is the tube, uh, and the seminal vesicle, the prostate gland, and the cowper's gland all add to the alkalinity of the, uh, of, of the individual's uh, semen. I think I told you we had a guy one time that came in um, and he was, uh, his, his semen wasn't uh, alkaline enough. It wasn't, it, you know, it was, a, it was a six instead of a five. Uh, so we were, we were trying to figure out what was going on. Uh, he went to a specialist and the specialist uh, checked all of his glands and what they determined was one of them was blocked. Uh, and so the only way that he could do that, I mean, you can't go in and unblock it. Uh, it's too delicate. Uh, all, all of those glands are too delicate. Uh, and he was, I don't know, he was only 22 or 23 years old. Uh, so they told him to try to unblock it by masturbating. He had a girlfriend, but he couldn't get her pregnant. And it caused a lot of frustration. 
He just had a girlfriend. He didn't have a wife. And for that reason, they weren't really trying to figure out how to get him uh, reproductive and make him reproductive uh, because he wasn't married. Uh, so he would come in every week and he'd give us a specimen. And we didn't need to do anything except check it for its, its alkalinity. Uh, so all we had to do was dip it with litmus paper. That's all we had to do. We didn't have to check it for sperm. We didn't have to look at motility. None of that stuff. Uh, we just had to check it to find out what his uh, alkalinity was. And eventually, after about six months, uh, something happened. He got a new girlfriend or something, and all of a sudden it unplugged itself, and he was reproductive. Whoops! And it made a mistake, and he made a mistake, because he, he got her pregnant almost right away. And of course, they weren't married, and he didn't like her that much. Yeah, I know. It's all, it always works out that way. Anyway. Yeah. Oh, we need to stop right here. We'll pick this up next time. <laughs>